Welcome. You are watching episode 74 of Regional Rap, pre-recorded on the morning of Wednesday, the 1st of February. Regional Rap, providing an insight on the issues affecting regional Australia and giving a voice to regional residents. My name is Bill Bates, and joining me on this episode, the New South Wales election 2023, rise or fall of the miners and independents, is my guest, Phil Donato, MLA. Hey, Good day, Bill. How are you? Good, thank you. A mem and member for the New South Wales New South Wales electorate of Orange. Phil was raised in Liverpool, New South Wales, and completed a pastry chef apprenticeship. However, he yearned for a more physical and demanding career, so he started his twenty-two year police. New South Wales police career. His academy training also introduced him to his future wife. <laughs> Phil's career progressed <clears throat> from general duties to police prosecutor. Seeking respite from the pressure cooker of that is Sydney, in 2005, he was transferred to the central table plan city of Orange, some 250 kilometres west of Sydney. In 2016, Phil contested the by-election for the state electorate of Orange and as the endorsed candidate of the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party. He won the seat by 55 votes. As the incumbent in the 2019 election, Phil retained the seat, securing more than 49% uh, of the primary vote and more than 65% of the two candidate preferred vote. Phil remains devoted to representing the people living in the communities of Orange electorate and the broader rural and regional communities of New South Wales. Also, he is a strong advocate for law-abiding shooters, fishers and farmers. On the 25th of March, Phil will once again re -seek, seek re election for the electorate of Orange, but this time as an independent. Welcome, Phil. Hey, Bill. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure, and I must thank you for your time. I know it's only it's about seven weeks to, your, to the actual election, so you must be run run off your feet uh, for all different sorts of appointments. Uh, but <laughs> I, no. I figure the people out in uh, Barwon and Murray will yes. have a lot more distance to cover the, cover than <laughs> you, although your your electorate's fairly uh, sizable. Yeah, look, it's nowhere near as big as either of those two seats, but it's still reasonably large. It's about just under 16,000 square kilometres, so um, it's a reasonable size electorate. But, uh, yeah, seven weeks to go before the next state election, which will be here before we know it. So there's a lot to do and uh, running as an independent this time, so there's a lot to prepare on my own, not having the backing of a party as well. So plenty to do, but, yeah, no, happy to chat and, and talk about regional New South Wales. Well, I think um, <laughs> the regions are sort of uh, need to sort of get a lot more attention as time goes on because uh, I, I know in Queensland I'm up here in Cairns yes. and with with Queensland and the Queensland government it's all yes. about southeast Queensland yes. and for New South Wales NSW stands for Newcastle, Sydney, and Wollongong and the rest yes. doesn't matter. So, do you, is that sort of the similar? Um, perception or feeling sometimes in in your regional community. Yeah, community definitely. Well? Yeah, definitely, Bill. I mean, um, it's it's a it's a colloquial sort of statement that a lot of people refer to New South Wales as Newcastle, Sydney, and Wollongong, and those west of the Sandstone Curtain or the Great Dividing Range. Um, we are we are lesser off in terms of when you look at health infrastructure and services. Um, you know, transport systems, roads, education, access to doctors, probably a lot of things that affect um, regional communities right across the nation, really. It's no different here in New South Wales. And what we've seen, I suppose, over the last good while is, is city-centric governments, whether it be the Liberal National Coalition government or whether it be the Labor government before that, um, fairly city-centric decision-making processes. I mean, obviously, that's where the bulk of the population live, and we accept that. But in saying that, um, regional New South Wales provides such a huge economic impact and contributed to the New South Wales economy. It's where we grow the food for the feeds, uh, the state, 
Uh, it's where we grow the wool and the cotton and all those things that clothe uh, most people around the world. And it's about time that we you know, get our fair share. And that was part of my platform when I ran in, in 2016, Bill, was ensuring that you know, Orange and regional New South Wales more broadly received its fair share because for a long time, we'd been overlooked and ignored and missing out. And uh, since I've been elected in, in 2016, I've really worked hard. I've got a great team working around me, but we've really worked hard to put regional New South Wales on the map by calling on the government, calling out, speaking out, not being a member of the government, not being a member of the National Party. I can speak out, raise issues on the floor of Parliament, in the media, and highlight things that we need um, you know, to ensure our fair share here in regional New South Wales. So uh, that then obviously flowed into the 2019 election. As you indicated in your introduction, Bill, the, you know, in, the 20, in 2016, I won by 55 votes. It was the biggest swing, I think, reported in New South Wales political history. The seat had been held by the National Party since World War II, 70 odd years. Um, they hadn't lost it. They held it by about a margin of 24 or 25%. Um, you know, it was, it was, it was, to be honest, it was an election that was, I wasn't expected to win. Um, and the fact that we scraped over the line by 55 votes was an amazing achievement. And I think went to um, the sentiment that a lot of people were feeling, not just here in Orange, but more broadly across regional New South Wales, that, you know, we needed someone who's prepared to speak up and fight and, and call out the government of the day and ensure that we receive our fair share. And that then obviously flowed into 2019, uh, worked extremely hard across the ground over those couple of years. We had a drought in New South Wales at that time, which um, the government were very slow to come to the table. The National Party didn't even want to talk about drought in New South Wales. And I was on the floor of parliament asking questions, making speeches, raising the issues with ministers, eventually forcing the government to deliver on freight subsidies, um, you know, for drought affected farmers to pay for, or help go to pay for fodder um, that was being transported. A lot of it was coming from Victoria at the time. So there was a huge cost in terms of that. Uh, and other regional issues, like, like I said, health, palliative care, mental health, a lot of those things really in regional New South Wales that were, were non-existent. So <clears throat> that led into, like I said, the 2019 election. And off the back of that, um, the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party, which I ran for in the 2019 election, we were successful in getting um, two other members elected into the New South Wales Parliament, that being Roy Butler in Barwon and Helen Dalton in Murray. And at the time, the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party, you know, geographically represented about 55% of New South Wales with those three seats, which, in a, you know, in the space of three years, we'd gone from no seats to three seats and half of the state. Um, I think it showed a fairly strong sentiment that the National Party was on the nose and they wanted someone who's going to work hard on the ground and not have to toe the party line and sell out to city-centric decision-making. I think... New South Wales and Queensland have a very similar issue in regards to it's actually worse in Queensland because the Nationals and the Liberals merged in about 2008. So yeah. regional Queensland has actually been deserted by the Liberals mm. and obviously the Catters, Catters have grown mm. and picked up three mm. seats. Uh, mm. But overall, the especially in Central and North Queensland, the Labor Party is pretty well entrenched. Um, yeah. One Nation has got a seat down in Morani with Steve Andrews. Um, yeah. But it, it's it's the same sort of problem mm. uh, as that connection between the Liberals and Nationals, which is worse here because they're actually merged. Yeah. But in New South Wales, they actually got almost joined at the hip, if not yeah. <laughs> right at the yeah. shoulder blades, I think, because... Uh, <laughs> They, they they work in step with what, uh, and I think it goes back to, uh, I'm not sure, Baird, Baird or uh, yeah. that, when the <laughs> merger for, for, for councils yeah. occurred. Now, yeah. you would think anyone with a bit of a br political brain would have looked at what happened in Queensland mm. because mm. we did that mm. you know, long yeah, before we did that a couple of elections before that yeah. came in, into uh, an issue in New South Wales. And it was nothing but a big stink. Yeah. And everyone resented it. A lot of, a lot of um, good, small, well-run uh, mm. councils were mm. absorbed and they had surplus and they got mm. absorbed into mm. bigger councils like mm. Rockhampton and Mackay mm. and, mm. and uh, 
Ingham and things like that. Yeah. And they lost they lost all that surplus and it just went went to the majors. Now, when we got uh, the Newman government in 2012, we says, well, you can go back if you want to, but it's all at your cost. Yeah. And one of the things that, of course, happened, the people who had who wanted to go back now never had never had the access to the surplus that they built up yeah. because it was all dissipated. Yeah, yeah. So there was a lot of lessons to be learnt from there, but <laughs> New South Wales went ahead and did it as, as well and yeah. matched to the angst. And at the same time, on the back of a, uh, I think it was a Four Corners or mm, mm. Uh, Channel yeah, 2 report corners, about the Greyhounds, a one-off yeah. incident sort of thing, overnight they just decided to kill the, uh, kill the Greyhound industry. Yeah, and yeah. that was, I think that was the catalyst probably to the, your initial success. Yeah, that was, Bill. You're, you're exactly right. Those, those were two big issues back in 2016 that led into my election and, and, and the Force Council mergers was a big issue. Um, Kabon Council, which is a council in my electorate, um, which basically, if you can picture, you know, you've got orange in the middle, then you've got a donut like Kabon that sort of circulates um, the orange um, city council or shy um, city council. So Kabon um, were looking at being amalgamated, forcibly amalgamated, and they weren't happy about it. The overwhelming majority of people in Kabon certainly were not happy about it. Because we know in, in regional New South Wales, local council, it's grassroots democracy. There's a lot of jobs employed in local depots and villages across the Kabon district as well. There was concern about the future of those positions and they were, like I said, a large employer of many people that lived in Kabon. So that was a huge issue. Um, the Greyhounds was a massive issue in my electorate and, and no doubt led to my election. I, I don't, I don't um, sugarcoat it or don't try and say it wasn't any of those issues that played a massive factor in me getting elected. Um, the greyhound industry, um, uh, like you said, city-centric, left-leaning decision-making by a conservative government um, and the National Party just went along with it. Um, they may have been in behind the scenes opposed to it, but they weren't prepared to stand up and speak out, certainly in the public. They, they, they voted against supporting the greyhound industry when it came to the crunch in Parliament. And, um, you know, regional New South Wales, a lot of greyhound owners and trainers in the Orange area. Um, we, an interesting fact, um, Bill, you probably don't realise this, but um, greyhound racing in is an industry in Orange that goes back, you know, a century. Uh, we used to have a local track here that got closed about 20 odd years ago, but there are so many, um, you know, some of the, the best trainers in Australia and breeders in Australia come from Orange in the Central West in my, in my electorate. You know, um, there's a there's a dog that still holds a, the the lap record at, at Wentworth Park, uh, which is our you know the, the biggest track in in New South Wales, a major track where all the races occur. Shaky Jakey, that was bred you know 25 and trained 25 kilometres up the road from town here. Um, that was set back in 2014. Still holds the lap record for that for that um, for that track, which is an amazing effort. Ran one race, won it, set the lap record. The owner was offered a million dollars for it. <laughs> and he, he sent it to stud after that. So um, he kept the dog and, and used it for breeding. But, uh, you know, and then we've got um, the most recent, recently there was a, the million dollar race that was at Wentworth Park only in the last few months. Three of the seven dogs were, were from Orange. So nearly half the field from Orange. So we've got, we've got some of the, the best trainers and breeders in the country right here in, on my doorstep. So it's a huge industry in our town. But it really set a precedent, I suppose, and, and whether it's greyhounds or whether it was firearms owners or whether it's farmers or, you know, whatever industry or, or, or group it might be, it, it demonstrated that this government, this Liberal National Government under uh, Mike Baird, who was the Premier at the time, you know, without any consultation, on the back of a Four Corners episode, were prepared to decimate a whole industry, um, predominantly that was located in regional New South Wales, um, you know, we've, we've had any proper consultation and it just, it just, I can still remember waking up to the news when it happened and I was in the police force, I was prosecuting at the time and I woke up and heard the news and I thought, gee, that's pretty rough on the back of a TV show showing the overwhelming majority of Greyhound people do the right thing. It doesn't matter what industry or, or group you're involved in, there's always going to be a, a minority who do the wrong thing. But you shouldn't punish the overall industry and the majority of people who do the right thing because of 
the actions of a few or a very minority group, a minor group. So I thought, geez, we've just closed the whole industry, got to be in the whole industry, you know, and I and I related it back to firearms owners, you know, like it, it, it's the same sort of thing. And I'm, you know, I've been a firearms owner all my life, pretty much. Um, um, and it's sort of the thought, well, you know, it's no different really. Um, something happens and they just ban firearms or ban fishing or ban some sort of farming method. Like it's just like I just knew it was wrong. I knew it was a decision that was going to impact people in regional New South Wales. And that was that was, you know, one of the reasons that led me to to, to motivate me to run because I thought this is this is not right what's happening here. We're not having this left leaning, you know, so called conservative government making these decisions um, that's adversely affecting people in regional New South Wales. I just you know, I just thought we just can't have this. And the National Party, like you said, joined at the hip, shoulder, wherever. Um they didn't show any spine, that's for sure, in standing up to the Liberals about, you know, publicly opposing this. Beryl Lowry used to be the leader of the Nationals, was it, in mm. New South Wales? Yeah, he, uh, was. he, since... wasn't, he, he wasn't at the time of the ban. Troy Grant was, but, yeah, John Beryl yeah. Lowry. But, but he's gone now. Yeah. But I, I, I'm not aware, of, being in Queensland, I'm not aware of the, of the leader of the... Uh, nationals in new south wales at the moment would not have any yeah. idea of who do you think the nationals have learned anything over the last two elections to sort of maybe uh, at least dislocate themselves a little bit from from the liberals or were they yeah, best look, I, I think i think they tried i mean john barillaro um you know threatened to quit the coalition i don't know if that made the news in queensland but over over a koala set and uh, among other things and he threatened to, and Gladys Berejiklian was the premier then, and she she basically stared him down, and you know, <laughs> well, if you want to quit the coalition, you know, you guys lose all your ministries. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, the National Party soon fell back into step, and um, you know, they 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 talk big, um, but when it crunches to the crunch, that you know, they, they rarely ever go through with it. And they've been in a coalition with the Liberal Party here in New South Wales for many years. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's probably personally, I know it, um, uh, it, it does wedge them on certain issues, um, you know, no doubt, because the Liberals are a very city-centric um, decision-making government, uh, you know, uh, leaning government, and that's, that's fine. That's their constituents that they're appealing to. And, but, you know, we've, we've seen over years that the National Party basically haven't really stood up, although since I've been elected, um, it really sent shockwaves through Macquarie Street. It's like, who's this guy from the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party who's come from nowhere and now got himself elected? Um, and the National Party have had to have had to pivot and do more for regional New South Wales. And we've seen a lot more investment um, coming into the regions now than what there ever was. Um, so that's been a good thing, I suppose, in terms of um, when I was elected, it really shone a light that the National Party had a competition. They didn't have mortgages on these seats in the bush that they could just take for granted and, and expect to get re-elected every election. So they've had to actually now, and competition's good, right? I don't mind competition. I welcome it. Um, uh, I think it's good. It brings out the best in, in, in people or teams or groups, whatever it is, or in business, doesn't matter what it is, right? Um, so they've got to know that there's other people out there in the community or other parties or other members or independent members now who are snapping at their heels, holding them to account and not letting them just, um, you know, get away with things that they probably got away with in the past. In uh, Victoria, we just had their election back in November mm. and the, there were three independent members, one for, um, I think it was Mordura, Shepparton and mm. uh, Morwell. But the, Morwell was actually a guy who was elected as a national and separated from him because he had some issues yeah. <laughs> going yeah. to court somewhere along the line uh, but those all those three independents lost in the la in the last election mm. now you're an independent mm. now what does your your electric need and what are the prime things that you're trying to get across the line or relate to the constituents what you're fighting yeah. for them yeah yeah well like i said earlier like health services are big things so whether that be um, you know, access to medical services, resources, infrastructure, things like a CT PET scanner, for example. If you don't have one here in Orange, we've got a we've got a terrific medical profession 
who are based here in Orange. We've got a, a basically the largest um, uh, base hospital in in Western New South Wales that has um, caters for um, acute conditions from right across New South Wales. We've got um, two private hospitals as well um, in our town. So um, we are very lucky and fortunate in Orange in terms of having um, the specialists and doctors that we have, but we're lacking some infrastructure in terms of, like I said, the PET CT scanner. Palliative care was a big thing and I worked hard with the community in relation to restoring palliative care a dedicated palliative care facility and beds here in Orange. They weren't, um, there weren't any at the time. So we've been able to get two dedicated uh, and a surge of another two, so up to four beds um, at the Orange Health Service that are, you know, two of those are dedicated palliative care beds and surge capacity to go into another two. And we're looking and working towards getting a, a dedicated hospice, which would also be able to cater for people not necessarily the end of life, but people who, um, who, who, who are palliative, um, but need um, the families might need respite, and then and, uh, someone can go in there and, and for a week or two, and the family can have some respite, and they can go back home. So there's some of the you know in terms of health, obviously roads. Um, you know, there's uh, <laughs> there's been a lot of conjecture over Bell's Bell's Line Expressway or a tunnel through the mountains. The government came out recently and indicated they've got to do that now. I think they're they're back treadling a little bit because. The federal government hasn't come through to the party with that, but that's something. Our road infrastructure and road network, we've got smashed with potholes and damage with the floods and the heavy rain that we've had over the last 12 or so months in, in New South Wales. So there's a huge repair bill um, that councils, um, the majority of these are council roads, some of them are state roads, but um, councils are going to need support for. I've been calling on the government to do that and they've delivered with about close to $500 million for, for regional councils, although half of that's going to the state, to the city, I should say. Um, but, um, you know, New South Wales farmers think it's going to be close to $3 billion to repair the road network in New South Wales, um, to restore productivity, to improve efficiencies and to overall, overall improve safety. So that's a huge repair bill. Um, and that's really important. So cost of living and cost of living pressures is, is becoming um, particularly relevant at the moment, whether it be the cost of groceries or electricity or fuel or or, or whatever it is it might be. Um, obviously, rising interest rates of late too have added pressure onto the home budget. The cost of living is becoming a huge issue. Um, access to general practitioners in the bush doesn't matter, I suppose, where it is in the bush. It's probably a problem in Queensland as well, but um, especially in, in some of the more smaller, more remote communities, um, that's a real problem. So. Look, I suppose half of it, half the issues are identifying them. Uh, we've been calling on the government to raise the Wangla Dam wall, which they didn't promise, and now they <laughs> nothing's happened there either. You know, they promised to raise that by ten meters um, back in twenty twenty. Work was supposed to commence. Here we are, you know, three years later nearly, and we're still waiting for a shovel to be turned. And that that would have had an impact on flood mitigation in the Lachlan Valley and Forbes, no doubt, no doubt. So that's something really important and something I'll be pushing and. Um, placing pressure on the government to deliver. Uh, mental health services uh, is a big problem. Um, access to proper psychologists or psych psychiatrists. I mean, to see a psychologist or a psychiatrist, often you have to wait months to get an appointment. Um, it's unsatisfactory. Um, so, you know, mental health's a big issue. Obviously, we had droughts, we've had floods, we've had COVID, we've had mice plagues, we've had, you know, a, a whole range of things over the last few years. The pestilence. <laughs> yeah, that's really taken a toll on a lot of people uh, mentally. So we need to have more improved mental health services in the bush, especially, um, like I said, for my for my area. So there, there's some of the major issues that I'm really focusing on this electorate, this, this election, I should say, for my electorate. Um, there's a lot to be done, um, you know, seven weeks out, and you know, running as an independent this time. So uh, this will be the first time I've run as an independent, and I only I only um, resigned from the Shooters, Fishers, and Farmers Party in December due to some issues. But um, you know, I think there comes a point in time where you know you back what you've done over the last six years as being the local member. You back the hard work and and the commitment that you've given to the community. I think, um, like I said earlier, I've got a pretty good team that have worked extremely hard as well um, that support me. So, you know, it's it's not going to be easy, but, um, you know, I think you do your best. People in regional New South Wales, especially in the Central West, 
you know, they appreciate genuine, hardworking people. Um, you know, Orange has a history of having an independent federal member in the past, Peter Andron, who was a, the federal member for Calair, and, and a lot of people back in the late 90s, early 2000s, and a lot of people, um, you know, remember Peter and, and regard him as probably the best local politician they've ever had. So there has been a history of independent representation in this area. The federal member went independent a few weeks after I did. He quit the, the National Party. <laughs> oh, so, I think he's independent again, isn't he? He's independent now. So, look, um, <laughs> lots more work to do with the independent. You don't have the, 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 the backing of a big party, the financial backing of a party, um, the resources of a party. Um, but, you know, I think um, sometimes you've got to be true to yourself too. And, uh, you know, I think that's... And that's one of the reasons I'm running as an independent. Just just start going back to um, fair share and all those sort of things, yeah. we have that same catch cry yeah. up in nor northern Queensland, we want no fair share. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm an advocate of a separate state. We need a north Queensland state. <laughs> and and I, I, I reckon fair share is not the issue. The issue yeah. is representation. Yeah. And uh, you've got a situation, you've now got 8.5 million people in New South Wales so yeah. Western Divide, you only got about eight seats. Yeah. Now, as Queensland grows to eight million or so, yeah. our, our 17 seats in Central and North Queensland probably evaporate down to 10 as well. So yeah. it's the lack of rep representation, yeah. I think, think, is an issue for regional yeah, yeah. regional um, Australia in general. Yeah, no, you're exactly right, Bill. I think people like the fact that they know that you can't do deliver on everything, right? But they want someone who's approachable, who's accessible, and that's going to, you know, who's who's going to listen to their concerns and fight for them. Um, but know that you can't perform miracles and that you can't do everything. But I think they like having that connection with a, a local representative who, who they know and trust that can work hard for them. The other thing is too is political parties are focused on delivering things to people, and I I think they've lost the idea of how about a little bit of actual wealth creation infrastructure? Mm. And so they spend billions and billions in, in Sydney and things like that to build a tunnel for a kilometre or something. But mm. that that amount of money spent in the regions, mm. you know, would create dams, better mm. road infrastructure, better mm. rail infrastructure mm. that would enhance economic growth. And the return for the dollar, right, mm is going to be much greater. It's it's going to grow the pie. Whereas mm. you build a tunnel in in New South in Sydney or or Brisbane, it's actually a liability forever. It it, it always requires subsidies to to keep it going. It's mm. a high maintenance type thing and mm. it, it never never generates a dollar profit. Mm. Um, mm. Mm. Yeah, you're right. I mean, return on investment is always, you know, the government always hides behind these business cases that they get done and <laughs> never, you never see the, never see them. There was, um, there was a business case that the government commissioned for um, fast rail, Mick Norton's report, I think it was called. He was the, the fellow who was doing it, a fellow from the UK. And um, we've called for it. We haven't seen it. The government's been Although I did see something in the media just recently that there were some little bits that were leaked out. Obviously, it wasn't good news. Government didn't want it, people to know about what, what it contained. Um, so, you know, complete lack of transparency there. But you're right. I mean, we need to look at nation building infrastructure projects. Um, we've got the inland rail happening in through my area. So, you know, that's, that's a federal government thing. But that was um, to link up the ports of Brisbane and Melbourne. Um, Parks, which is part of my electorate, where they have the Elvis Festival every year, is about the halfway point. So um, they're creating a special activation precinct and an inter-module inter module, I think they call it, um, a hub anyway, um, that will be a, a hub where local pro you know farmers can bring their produce. They'll be able to load it to the trains, get it to the ports of Brisbane and Melbourne, and obviously get it exported as quickly as possible. So that's that's a good thing, but that's been snagged up a little bit, but that's going along. But, um, you know, dam building is another huge thing that we need to look at. I mean, we've just had all these floods and, and rain, and I, I read somewhere only this morning that Wyangla had, you know, could have been filled up four times um, the amount of water that came through and was being released because it was at capacity, you know. But they'll still want their environmental flows. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it doesn't matter how so, much it's gone through. We've got to allocate next year's by environmental flows. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's some photos on social media doing the rounds of the Boangla Dam. You could probably Google it and find it um, overflowing, and it's 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 like a torrent of water. Yeah, unbelievable um, the amount of water that was released because it just didn't have the capacity to hold anymore. And we've got to learn to harness it when we can, right? And and the Boangla Dam is a not only for irrigation but for flood mitigation as well. And um, you know, it's it's really important dam building projects. We haven't built a dam in over thirty years in New South Wales. And it's all this red and green tape, you know, that the, you get the, filled up with. The last is, 20 dams have been built in in uh, Tasmania. Yeah. 18 of the last 20 dams have been built into Tasmania. Work that out. And the other thing is a lot of them are actually private dams. Mm, mm, uh, so mm. that for Pacific um, industries and things like that. Yeah. Uh, so obviously the mainland's lost the plot as <laughs> far as dams go. <laughs> um, but I, I probably need to clear, I have spoken previously on this, this show with uh, Robert Borzak, oh, yeah. Mark Benazayek and yeah, Helen yeah. Dalton. Oh, now, yeah. with, with Mark, it was basically the success of the students, fishers and farmers, uh, especially after they got their free seats in the yeah. 2019 election. Yeah. And I thought, gee whiz, this is this is good news because it's it's a possibility we're going to have someone to mm. sort of replace the or nationals or mm. You know, mm. and actually represent mm. the uh, people of the regions. Mm. Uh, and then I also I also spoke to uh, I spoke with spoke with Mel, uh, Mark in regards to he was the chairman of the uh, Sustainable Timber Industry Inquiry. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Which was which is a big disappointment. I I don't know where the foresters and the loggers are in regards to fighting for for the industry, but they're just mm. watching. Uh, we're just watching it ebb away, sort of thing. Mm. And I spoke to um, Helen uh, after yeah. I spoke to um, the Southern Irrigation oh, people yeah. in regards to Chris Brooks and that, and and the yeah. environmental flows and things like that. To get a bit of perspective on what goes down and why there's a separation of the way people in the southern area want, yeah. want things and the people in the north, yeah. and it seems that water was the thing was that broke the back of the shooters, fishers, and farmers. What I that's just from a distance from here from Cairns, so that's the observation. But water yeah. was a problem. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, that was probably more of an issue between um Murray like Helen and, and, and Roy, obviously they represented different areas of the state, north and south, and, um, you know, that, that water was one issue. Um, you know, I left the party over um, a number of issues, which I won't go into here, but um, obviously the one that did culminate was when Robert Borzak made a statement in Parliament that, it, you know, Helen Dalton should be clocked. Those were, those were his exact words. Mm. And, you know, that for me, that was the final straw. So, um, you know, it's a shame. It is a real shame. Uh, bill because we did have something going and um, we tried to resolve it internally we couldn't um, and at the end of the day like I said earlier you've got to be true to your own personal um, ethics and values and morals and all those things and I couldn't continue running with a party or under a leader like Robert Borzak who was who was you know um, didn't see an issue with that comment um, you know so that was that was probably the catalyst I'd say for me leaving the party and, and probably um, Roy Butler as well. I mean, we both resigned I, from the party, um, you know, within the. Within the I, I did do a fair bit of research on shooters and fishers and farmers yeah. before yeah. I spoke to them and that and went through the constitution yeah. and their history and that. Yeah. But they have, I think their problem stems from the fact that they were born in Sydney, they were, they were in the upper house only for so long. Mm -hmm. uh, and they continue to, I mean, if, if you look at the constitution, it still reads like a lobby group. Uh, it just says basically go to look after this group of people. Um, yeah. But when you, and that's fine when you're in the upper house. Yeah. But when you actually got to look after a set of constituents and especially rural, your mindset should have, to, well, it needs to change. Um, you're exactly and, right. You're exactly right. To get elected in the upper house, you need, Three percent, four percent of the vote, maybe from all over the elected. state. That's the difference. All over the state to get represent to get elected in a in a in a electorate, you need fifty percent plus one. 
Um, you need to be, you know, you need to be a little bit more diverse across the issues. Um, you know, and that's look that we probably a little bit the victim of our own success. We grew very quickly from no representation in the lower house to having three in three years, right? So there's always challenges with that. Um, it is a real shame because we did have something going that was, you know, a real threat to the National Party and it would kept them on their toes. Um, and, and both Roy and myself did not want it to come to this. We did not want to leave the party, but we were left with no option. So, you know, that was that was my decision and, and Roy's as well. But um, it is a real shame. It is a real shame. But, you know, and it, look, it's, it's, it's created a lot more work for us as individuals, um, especially myself. I can't speak for Roy so much, but I'm sure he's working hard. He's even got a bigger electorate. So he's got a, you know, as an independent, he's got all yeah, He's got three offices. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got a lot more staff too. That's right. Um, but, you know, so, yeah, it's a, it's a real shame. And, you know, I think um, egos got in the way a bit, which is a real shame as well. Yeah, well, well like I was saying, I, I was disappointed because I was looking at from a North Queensland, Central Queensland mm. perspective. Mm. I think we're, we're the sort of, the group, we've got the same sort of mindset of a lot of people there that yeah. that, that would have uh, fit, fitted into. The only trouble mm. with the in Queensland, we don't have that luxury of an upper house where you can go yeah. build from a small um, one of you know get mm. into the upper house, mm. uh, fight for, fight for what you want, get yeah. a bit of profile, um, and maybe eventually get two two members in the upper house. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we 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 don't have that luxury in in Queensland. So yeah, the shooters fishers were. Had a bit of a, had a bit of a problem in regards to well, it's a big state, so where do you yeah. focus? And they they sort of never got to that sort of stage. And yeah. actually, they've just been deregistered as a political party. Mm. Um, I think it was in November last year um, mm. on the basis. Uh, While well, the report in the uh, electoral commission said they didn't couldn't show their five hundred yeah. membership. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah so they're, they're just been be deregistered, which is un unfortunate. Uh, it wasn't built on. Um, but now that you go into this election as independent, and uh, same with Helen, same with Roy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> are, are the shooters, fishers, and farmers standing candidates in those three seats against you as well? Um, look, at, at the moment, they haven't. But I'm hearing that they will, um, certainly my seat. I don't, I, I don't know about um, Barwon and Murray. Um, certainly, um, you know, it's, it's that, that was always Robert Borzak's intention, I think, to run candidates against us. So, look, we'll just wait and see. I mean, what they choose to do is a matter for them. It doesn't really bother me. Um, I just get on with the job that I've been elected to do and, you know, there's a lot to do. Um, so, you know, it's it, they, they're entitled to put someone up if they wish to. That's a matter for them. Um, at the end of the day, that's out beyond my control. Um, that's really their decision, and you know we'll just continue doing what we do in in, in our in my electorate. So, what's the dialogue like between yourself and Roy and and Helen? Is there dialogue there? Because yeah. because, because yeah. you you your three seats west west yeah. and New South Wales basically. Yeah. Um, no, so, so, you, so you're all, 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 all on the same river systems and things like that? Oh, uh, yeah. yeah <laughs> and connected? Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, I mean, not as... Yeah, look, we've got the Lachlan, which eventually, I suppose, um, through other tributaries, flows down that way. But, look, um, you know, I've got good dialogue with both Roy and, and Helen. I don't have, um, you know, I'm, I'm, don't have an issue with either of those two. You know, they're... Um, it's we have we have you know we speak from time to time and, and we don't have any problems there. Yeah. If I we need to compare it, things, you know, we can mm -hmm. sort of bounce off each other too. <laughs> well, I, su I suppose the other thing is with being independent, it becomes more of an issue what's happening in in your electorate, yeah, um, than anything that that becomes paramount. Yeah, and m maybe some decisions, you know, they may be good for your electorate, mm. but they're not overly good for either the state or the nation because <laughs> of the focus. Yeah. Now, now we've got a situation. Um, I keep a very strong eye on on renewables and oh, yeah. and, and the circumstances yeah. that are going on there. Now, a lot of lot of councils and, and even electorates are sort of 
buying into the renewables mm. um, and ignoring, and then at the same time whinging about the price rise of electricity. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. So, so it's it's become a bit of a, a, a issue, and yeah. more and more in Queensland, we've I've noticed yeah. as the number of projects grow, the number of groups against them grows. Yeah. Um, we, we've got from basically from Cairns down to yep. Townsville, there's about seven or eight projects in the white land pipeline. Then you get down past the verdict and there's more. And yep. it's just more as these projects pop the head up, more yep. and more Facebook groups are popping up, yep. complaining about them. So it, it's going to be an issue for, for a lot of electorates. Um, yeah, yeah. How do you think you can manage sort of, well, all right, financially, you might bring you a few jobs in that, but then mm -hmm. other people complain that it hurts your environment. So, yeah, as, oh, as look at the you've got a little bit of scope to play around in there rather than being locked into a into yeah. a, into a policy of a party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I mean, obviously, you make a, a judgment call based on a number of factors. Um, you know, with location effect impacts on the environment, impacts on people, um, adjoining landholders, local communities. Obviously, you look at jobs. Jobs is always important. Um, you know, and, and it's there's a number of factors you sort of weigh in. It's no different to, say, a mine going in. And, you know, we've got Cadia in my electorate. We've got North Parks Mine. We've got a few large mines that um, employ a lot of people. And um, so it's no different to those types of issues. You're always going to get people for and against it. And at the end of the day, you, you, you try and weigh it all up and make the best decision that you think is in the best interest of the majority of the people in your, you know, whether it be in the state or in my electorate. So... Um, you know, in terms of what you're speaking about, you know, I've got a view that, you know, like a lot of these solar farms on, on prime agricultural land shouldn't be happening um, on prime agricultural land. And that's that was our policy with the party as well, right? So that, that, those things don't change from my perspective. Um, you know, we're elected to make decisions. Um, and, you know, sometimes um, you make a decision that may not be the popular decision, but it might be the right decision. But if you've got to weigh up all the competing factors and interests and take into account consultation with the local community, look at the positive benefits, look at the negative impacts, look at all that. It's, it's, it's sometimes not an easy decision, but at the end of the day, you're elected to make a decision. So, um, you know, you look at what you think would be in your own, in your own view and, you know, what would be the best outcome for the community more broadly. But I expect also the, the people electing you expect you to conform into a certain sort of box. They, they've got a perception of that. Um, and then if an issue comes up and you sort of vote outside what they were elected you for, uh, it, it can can cause issues. I mean, if you go back to the days of Oakshot and Windsor, yeah. I mean, they, they were in a real rural areas. And most of the people who voted them weren't weren't voting for a federal Labor government, yeah, yeah, yeah. but that's what they got. Yeah, uh, I mean that's one of the things Australia lacks. It should have a recall system where pe when people do such things like that, you sh the electorate yeah. should be able to uh, recall them for a, for a new election. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I think that was one of the problems with the shoe deficiency of farmers. Mm -hmm. I mean, I because I've been engage with them for some time we're looking yeah. at their facebook pages and that yeah there was a lot of occasions where their members or the people uh, commenting on the facebook were sort of confused where they stood because on one issue they sort of voted along with the greens and another one they voted there and that people didn't quite get where they were actually locked in but i suppose that's because a they haven't got a constitution that locks them anywhere in the spectrum mm. of, of politics, right or left. Mm. So they just basically got to do the best deal they could for the shooters, fishers and farmers, depending on the issue. But yeah, I think that's a lot, right. of, lot of their members couldn't sort of yeah. understand that sway. So, and that, I think that's a thing for, for independence as well as, as an issue, because you haven't got a constitution, you haven't got a, a set well, this, I'm sort of centre left, or or mm. for big government, little government, or whatever. You mm. don't have those sort of constraints mm. that, that sometimes the constituents can get. Oh, well, I didn't know he was on that side. I didn't know. Yeah. So, so how do, how do you sort of 
go to the election, go to the into the election campaign mm. on these sort of issues. Mm. And how do how do you manage to say, well, trust me, trust me, I'm going to <laughs> this is the line I'm going to deliver on, you know, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, it's a challenge, no doubt. Um, and and like you say, not having a party structure or platform of policies or, or constitution that you've referred to, um, you know, is is probably both good and bad. Um, I think it shows or provides us an adaptability that we can sort of pivot depending on the issue as well. And really, at the end of the day, ultimately you're elected by your constituents. So that's the first and foremost responsibility is to your local constituents in your local area. So they're the ones that um, elect you in and they're the ones that will could chuck you out. So, you know, they're the ones that you've got to be first and foremost uh, have as a priority um, in your thought process and any decision that you make. So yeah, you're right. It's it's a challenge. It's um, I suppose, like I said, you got to you got to weigh each matter up on its merits at the time. And it's sometimes um, you know you might support certain issues that people wouldn't expect you to support. For example, I'll give you a classic example was the voluntary assisted dying bill that we had here in New South Wales uh, for people suffering from a terminal illness that you know had been given a, um, a very short time to live, uh, less than six months were suffering from extreme pain and, you know, there, there was a number of safeguards. Um, I supported it, right? I voted in favour of it because overwhelmingly um, my community wanted me to do it, but ultimately as well, from my own personal experiences, and we've all had probably seen family members pass away and, you know, suffering from whether it be cancer or other things, and it can be quite quite cruel seeing them um, in their final stages. So. I supported it. Um, the guys in the upper house didn't, and that was their decision. It was a conscious vote for us. So um, we weren't voting as it was for, I think, every other party as well. So, um, you know, so things like that, that maybe conserve, traditional conservative people on, on the face of it, you think wouldn't support that, right? Um, but overwhelmingly, the majority of people did support it, even, even um, you know, people that were conservative, traditional conservatives, or people that... Um, you know, of religious faith, um, a lot of those also could see, understand it as well. So it was one of those really difficult issues and matters to, to take into account. But at the end of the day, like I said, that's what we're elected to do, right? Sometimes you've got to make a tough decision. You're not going to please everyone all the time. And I think if you do it on the basis that you're representing your constituents, that you think it's the right decision um, and you're doing it with the good intentions, I think that's ultimately all people can ask for, really. I think you, you are also in a fortunate position in regards to if you look at your two two third uh, candidate vote in the nineteen mm. election, it was mm. up at sixty five. So mm. basically, you, you can pretty well tell that the majority of people still sit in that national mm. party type mm. right, you know, conservative mm. traditional lines, um, and and this is one thing I don't quite get. A lot of people think Labor people are. Uh, just because it's Labor, that they're not traditional either. I mean, mm. I come from a, a Catholic family, voted mm. Labor all the time, mm. but you know, the, you, you know they're, they're strong on marriage, strong on all those sort of conservative yeah. type things. They, they weren't real progressive, but they still voted for Labor. So yeah. out in your area, I think you, with that sort of a numbers mm. uh, and you don't have that a big numbers of those fringe people like the Animal Justice Party, the yeah. Greens and things like that, you can you can set your course pretty well uh, mm. for the ma majority of your constituency. Mm. Uh, it's probably, and I think probably the same for for Roy and Helen uh, in the, in those types of electorates, and maybe even other other electorates like Dubbo and things. That this, yeah. it's the same sort of situation. It's only when you get in the city you get the you know, the lunatic French, you know, the teals and you know, pseudo intellectual type things, and that issue comes in. But you're really dealing with a, a lot of people who are pragmatic. And like you say, yeah. the euthanasia issue, right, it does bring out a lot of, a lot of emotion for yeah. a small percentage of people, you know, who on the conservative side who maybe go to church or things like that. Mm -hmm. But overall, the pragmatism of mm. even you know a bulk of those people is mm. yes we've seen the suffering of our parents and that we don't want mm. that to happen we we mm. want to want we want we want improvements mm. and like I say that's why you can make those sort of decisions yeah yeah you're right I mean you're right and people in the regions are pretty uh, pragmatic uh, you're right you know <laughs> um, 
And, uh, you know, it was about giving people a choice. It didn't mean you had to follow that. Obviously, it gave people a choice in that particular situation. So, um, and, you know, I looked at it fairly closely. I had to satisfy myself that the safeguards that were in the legislation were sufficient in my belief. Um, and that's a judgment call that you make based on your background, your experience, your knowledge, your feedback, consultation with the community, a whole range of factors. You know, you sort of, um, so that was one of the things that I was really, um, with that particular legislation that I was really conscious of. Um, and I was satisfied that the safeguards that were incorporated on it were sufficient. So that's why I supported it. But, um, you know, that, that was something that I, I wanted to be really sure about myself um, before I was going to support legislation like that. But, um, yeah, you're right. It's it's pragmatism. It's being reasonable. It's being um, genuine. It's about it's about listening to your community first and foremost. It's about all those things that you take into account. We are still a a, a fairly um, conservative area, although we've seen a lot of people move into the since COVID. We've had a lot of <laughs> people move from the city into the central west because we're still only three hours from Sydney or three and a half hours from Sydney. Um, so there's been a lot of people with COVID, um, you know, leaving Sydney, working from home, um, more affordable housing. Although it's, it's it's creeping up in prices here as well as, as like most places, but certainly more affordable than Sydney. Um, and you know, good schools as well. We've got some terrific schools and great place, great place to bring up the family. So I'm not surprised we've seen an influx of people moving to to Orange um, in the last probably two or three years. And that, and that will sort of change the demographics a little bit too. Um, but look, overall, I think it's, it's still a reasonably conservative sort of area. Um, but like I said, people in my electorate, they're, they're genuine people, they're, they're, they're reasonable. Um, you know, if they see someone having a go, they'll support them. If they see someone working hard, who's genuine, who does all that, uh, does their best, they'll support them, right? And I think when you look back at the seats, the, the elections, certainly both at a state and federal level before my time, just, um, you know, it's generally, it's generally been fairly stable, I suppose, apart from my election, but that was a by-election and there were a number of issues, right? But generally the incumbent has always been successful and, you know, I think the people in the community generally um, have been... As you go, go into this election as, in, as an independent, um, mm. do you think... A lot of those people who supported you as student sisters and farmers and supported you came in. Do you get a feeling at least some of them will, you know, still say, "Well, you've done a good job," and 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 happy to help you, or or if you yeah, yeah. Well, well, cut off? Uh, <laughs> well, I hope so. <laughs> look, I think look the feedback I've received since I've announced that I've resigned from the party and running independent has been extremely favourable. I mean, um, people in the street stopping me, people that have contacted the office here and congratulating me. I mean, the, the overwhelming majority of people, I mean, look, there might be a small minority of people who would, who would be disappointed with my decision and I, I I expect and respect their decision. Like, there's not going to be everyone happy with what I do all the time, right? And people are going to be disappointed that I left the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party. And I respect that. I respect that. And, um, but... Look, I think um, there's also been, on, on the other side of that, on the flip side of that, there's also been a lot of people, um, a lot, a lot of people, I'm telling you, um, <laughs> that that have said to me, um, who have stopped me in the street or in the shops or, um, you know, oh, we, so, we didn't vote for you before because we didn't like the name of the party, right? We liked you, we liked you, but we didn't like the name of the party, right? Because they weren't shooters, they weren't. Yeah. Oh, that's but, right. But we'll it's vote for you. The name is very selective. Time. Yeah. We'll vote for you this time. So look, we'll find out on March twenty five. I guess uh, it's only six or seven weeks away. So actually, I think it can only do you good if you cut anything with Sydney. Like as far as I'm concerned, in regional Queensland, <laughs> if someone gives Brisbane a chop or you know <laughs> sticks it up to their headquarters or whatever, it, yay, you know. So uh, I think that's probably the issue too. Like I say, the shooters, fishers, and farmers. A the name. Right, it it was fine as a lobby group. It's not the thing for a party that represents a constituency of people who are engaged in business. You've got bakers, you know, you've got farmers, yeah. you've got business people, you've got real estate agents and things like that. It's got to be a bit more comfortable. And and yeah. I have I've spoken to uh, Robert Borzak, Mike Cleary, uh, oh. 
<laughs> Tim Baisley and says, you know, your name stinks, basically. Um, if, if you want to go ahead, you've got to, you've got to be more encompassing. And yeah. they won't have a bar of, you know, the name is sacrosanct, you know. The yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, look, I, I get that. <laughs> um, you know, when you, and like I said earlier, when you're in the upper house and you only need 3 or 4%, and that's your base that you're appealing to, that's fine. But when you're in the lower house and you need fifty percent plus one <laughs> to get elected, <laughs> uh, and that's what and that's and that's the difference, right? Between look, I and I've always always in the upper house voted for the Shooters Fishers Farmers Party before there was any, well, because that you know I was a, a law abiding firearms owner, I was a shooter, a hunter, um, all those things. And I have been since I was a kid, right, with my dad and uncles and all that sort of stuff, um, and and still enjoy doing that when I get the time to oh, learn, but don't get much time these days. <laughs> But um, you know, and that, and that, and I don't, you know, that I don't step away from that. I'll still represent the interests of law-abiding firearms owners. Um, you know, I think that, um, but you know, just, just, um, you're right. The name, the name puts a lot of people off, um, right or wrong, and I, oh, I can respect that. Not, not everyone is a, a law-abiding firearms owner or, a, or a, you know, a fisher or a farmer. But you know that's that's the history of the party, and I think under the current regime, um, who's running the party, they 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 want to stay with that, which I suppose supports them in the upper house. Um, so I can understand why they would want to do that. But um, to be more broadly appealing to the general public, it's problematic. With this election, is there any sort of big ticket items you, you want to sort of promote, you know, like you're talking about a dam there before that it, that needs to go ahead. I mean, that that's the same issue in North Queensland. Yeah. I mean, 80% of the uh, rainfall for mainland Australia falls, falls in northern Australia. Mm. And Townsville mm. and Cairns, we haven't got water security. Mm. You know, mm. A, the, Townsville, the, the reservoir's too shallow. It, yeah. it gets too hot. It gets out blue green algae. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Has to slow down the purification rate. In yeah. in Queen in in Cairns, we're growing towards you know two hundred thousand people, and we've got yeah. a you know the little reservoir that yeah. if we don't get rain in December, well, we've got to start immediately thinking about water restrictions. I mean, yeah. that's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but no one's well, willing to uh, put a shovel in the ground and build a dam. They're all too afraid. So well, with the amount of rainfall that you guys got up there, um, you know. Yeah, but it goes to sea in about two minutes. <laughs> got, I would have thought, um, you know, you'd want to be catching as much as you possibly can, and especially with the growing population, what you said around. Well, you, know, you like would think so, you would think so, but Brisbane doesn't seem to see it the way mm. we do. Mm. So mm. for Orange, mm. if if there was a couple of projects you think you know, sort of capital projects that would be key to the area. Uh, Beneficial to the area, beneficial to the state and to the nation as wealth growing uh, mm. uh, projects. So mm. it grows the pie for everyone. And I think this is where politicians have lost the plot. Mm. Their, their intent to rake in tax and distribute it out mm. as fast as they can to buy votes. But they don't seem to be engaged with growing the pie. So there's more to share out. Yeah, yeah. It's, we've become very stagnant in that nation building yeah. area. Yeah, um, well, like I said earlier, obviously that that tunnel or expressway over the Great Divide. Um, so, you know, the government mentioned that they were looking at this tunnel, um, and they've backtracked a little bit since the federal election and Labor got elected. And you know, but that's something that would really that, that would really open up the Central West in terms of productivity and and getting people out here, getting stuff. Um, you know, encouraging businesses to relocate out here that would then in turn lead to more jobs. Um, you know, really fast rail as well. Um, you could look at improving the, the rail network and rail system, both for passenger and freight um, from from the Central West, which, like I said, is one of the biggest economic contributors to the state. And you look at the GDP in terms of produce and 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 grain and 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 wool and cotton and all those things. So, um, really looking at uh, improving that sort of logistical side of getting getting produce to the ports as quickly as possible. Like I said, inland rail has been a good thing, but it's going pretty slow. Um, and and obviously the road network, like I said, has been smashed with the heavy rain that we've had. Roads are pothole ridden. There's people that who who refuse to take their caravans out, for example, because of the damage to the roads. And 
um, damage to their cars and, you know, so the road network really needs to be improved for, like I said, efficiencies, um, for productivity and for safety. So that's that's a real priority as well. And like I said earlier, um, uh, you know, dam building, the Wangla Dam Wall, which is something that we've been talking about for a long time, but then the National Party made a commitment they were going to have shovels in the ground by 2020, <laughs> October 2020, to raise it by 10 metres. Um, well, here we are in, in February 2023 and not a shovel has hit the ground, not a sod's been turned. The only sod's was turned was when the politicians went there and did their promotional... Yeah, you in, know, the, in the vis, put a, vis, put a high photo, vis and that. In the high vis uh, with, the, with the construction hat, you know, <laughs> um, which I can constantly keep reminding them about as well. Don't, don't, you, don't you worry about that. Um, so, you know, I think that and that's, a, that's a big irrigation um, as well as flood mitigation as well. So that would be, the Lachlan Valley is a very fertile valley that, you know, grows some of the best food and fibre in, in the state. So that would go a long way to to really shoring up, you know, in terms of nation building big infrastructure projects. I think that would be a few good ones just there. With with Orange, you've got um, Parks and Forbes. Uh, I'm, I'm familiar with Parks. I've been through there yeah. a number, number of times and, uh, yeah. and Went through there actually when the Elvis Presley uh, yeah. tribute see, thing I was on, up and, that, Elvis and that, that, I thought, gee whiz, I wish there was a bypass. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're building uh, a bypass. Well, they well, are well, building well, a I bypass. think I've been through, but I might have missed it. Um, yeah. So there, but they're still reasonably sized towns. Do you, is there sort of um, things you've got to consider for those two uh, major townships as well as Orange yeah. in regards to bouncing things out because um, in electorates, look, it, like even in in Cairns, there, there's three state seats. There's Mulgrave, Cairns, and mm. and uh, Barron River in in a mm. very small area, mm. uh, and Cairns is still the centre. So that those those types of candidates or members don't really have to worry about those those yeah. sort of things. It's just basically Cairns and suburbs. Yeah. Um, do you get sort of different inputs from people in Forbes yeah. and uh, yeah. or parks. priorities, I suppose? Yeah, yeah. Forbes and parks. Yeah, yeah, so Forbes, obviously, flood proofing the new highway, that's a big one. Uh, that road gets shut. You probably would have travelled on the new highway when yeah. you came down. Uh, you About know. 13 times. <laughs> so flood proof, that gets closed every time there's a major flood and Forbes gets, you know, that the new highway between West Island and Forbes gets closed for about six weeks, has huge economic impacts for Forbes. Um, downturn of local business, trade, tourism, all those things, and really reliant uh, on that places like Forbes. So that's been something I've been calling on, flood proof in New Highway. I think the state, uh, or sorry, the federal government just recently announced 100 million towards that project, only in the last few weeks. So um, That's we'll a couple of kilometres. Yeah, it's a couple of kilometres. It's about 21 kilometres, 22 kilometres of road that needs to be flood proofed that goes under when Lake Cow overflows. So... Um, Flood proofing a new highway. Forbes, as, as, and another thing for Forbes would be um, obviously health. That you know, once you go out to parks and Forbes, the health services and the delivery of um, uh, availability of, of doctors and medical specialists really diminishes. Um, everyone really has to come to Orange to see a specialist or Sydney. So um, you know, having a G, more GP, psychologists, psychiatrists, all that sort of availability for medical professionals in Forbes for parks. They've got the logistics, um, the logistics hub around the uh, activation precinct, which is circulates around that inland rail project. They've got the parks, the, the, the bypass happening. I think the federal government's tipped in some money as well as the states. So they're looking at a bypass to, to parks, and that in itself is always a bit controversial. <laughs> but, um, you know, benefits and negatives, but um, it would certainly diminish a lot of the heavy traffic going through through parks and the trucks and whatnot, the B doubles that go through. So um, you know, parks as well as and health, health's a big issue out there as well. Availability of health services. I don't even have you can't have a baby if you're in parks. You can't a mother can't have a baby at the parks hospital. You've got to go to Orange, Dubbo or or somewhere else. So too bad if you go into emergency labour and you you've got to be in hospital as quickly as possible. Um, so mater restoration of maternity services at Parks Hospital has been something I've been pushing as well. Um, you know, so yeah, look, every town's got its little issues that they need to be looked at and raised and addressed. And so, yeah, you have those nuances um, all across the whole electorate, really. 
Well, roads seem to be a big problem. I mean, Bruce Highway, uh, a national highway, main economic cor corridor, well, it gets wiped out for, <laughs> well, this year, uh, I think we've been wiped out for about six weeks at different times yeah. and at different different locations. And, and I mean, that, that's a national disgrace. Um, yeah. And the Newells, a major, major thoroughfare that, that needs to But I was just, just listening to you there in regards to um, the flooding and that, but sometimes I wonder, does the... Is it the road that needs to be flood proof, or do we need flood mitigation things that would stop it happen, happen anyway? You know, so yeah, yeah. yeah, no, the road, the road's got to be raised, um, and they need to put sufficient culverts underneath the road to still let the water flow and all that sort of stuff. Um, oh, it's a dam. The road's a dam. <laughs> well, the, the, no, the, the the road isn't a dam, but it, it would need to be raised because the water just goes straight across it, you know, <laughs> and then it's closed for six weeks. Um, so then you, what happens then is you get trucks and cars then having to go on other roads which really aren't right, built then, right. and that's right and and destroy those roads in the process because they weren't built for the heavy vehicles and the traffic volume to use their smaller you know less um lesser roads so you know and then once the water recedes i think they were pumping it actually um on the new highway they were pumping water out of there but it still took six weeks to to get it reopened and then the road you, you, you need to spend millions of dollars then fixing the road up because it's it's been oh. basically pothole ridden <laughs> and destroyed. Well, I know you're busy and you've got other things to do, and we've been going over our. So, that's uh, as much as I'd like to chat with you a little bit more about certain things. I think you're probably being pulled or noticed by people. <laughs> now you've got to be. Yeah, yeah. Else. Well, I've I've got to go to a meet and greet barbecue in about uh, forty five minutes. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, you, um, just before we wind up, yeah, can you sort of um. Uh, Give us a bit of an indication uh, what you'd like to appeal to your constituents in regards to the people who voted to you before as a shooters, fishers and farmers yeah. and now as an independent. Um, basically, what you if you had the chance to speak to each one of them individually, yeah. what you would be saying to them? Yeah. Oh, look, nothing really changes. I'm still the same person on the, on the ground, um, you know, um, just because I don't have the support of a party or the under the of a party, I'm still the same person. I still believe in the same sorts of things and still treat people um, and, and groups with the same level of um, respect and courtesy that I always have. And one of my, like I said earlier, some of the biggest things I believe in is being um, available and approachable to people. And you know, so I'll say we, we're about to head out to a, a meet and greet barbecue where I put on a free barbecue for. Um, the community it's a great way to, to meet people right and, and listen to them talk to them hear their concerns see what we can do to help them but um so nothing really changes there i'll continue being who i am um that's been one of the things since i've been elected um a, a very good friend of mine who i look up to very fondly who's a uh he said mate don't change don't change once you're elected don't don't think you're someone special or don't think you're, <laughs> you know just be yourself and i've tried and i've i think i've stayed true to that um you know of and you know, I like helping the people. I that's that's my enjoyment. Getting out of the office. I hate being in the office. <laughs> I hate sitting behind a desk. I, I'd much rather be out in the community, doing things, doing work in the community, and and trying to help people. Fundamentally, that's what I want to do, right? It's no different to the cops, yeah. <laughs> um, or being a prosecutor in court, where I was helping victims all the time, representing victims, whether they be victims of domestic violence or assaults or break and enters or whatever it might have been. Um, fundamentally, it's it's all about trying to help people and get better outcomes for people in the community and their lives, and try and make a difference. So, none of that changes. I'll continue to still do that, and if I'm fortunate enough to be re-elected after March, well, then we'll keep we'll keep on with what we've been doing for the last six years. Well, I hope I'll have a chance to talk to you in a few <laughs> months' time, as still catch up after the election. election. <laughs> I wish you. I wish you all the all, all the success for the elections, um, and uh, uh, keep up the good fight and, and keep rural and regional people first and foremost at the centre of your heart. Yeah, no, never, totally. we need it because we're we're getting out so outnumbered by voices by, by places like Sydney and Brisbane. Yeah, no, no, thanks, thanks, Bill. I really appreciate your kind words, and and you too, you and. You and Andrew for hosting the um, putting on the regional wrap. It gives people like myself and other MPs a, a platform to be able to raise issues and discuss issues and 
you know, people in the out there in social media world or YouTube or Facebook, wherever they might be watching, an opportunity to to hear from people like myself, um, people who are in positions of you know influence, that we can hopefully you know get better outcomes for regional New South Wales or regional Queensland. Doesn't matter where it is. Um, you know, it's all insuring. We all pay our taxes. We're all, we're all, it doesn't matter where we live. It doesn't matter what postcode we live in. Um, we should all be entitled to the same level of delivery of services, whether it be, you know, it doesn't matter if it's health or roads or, or transport or whatever. We shouldn't be discriminated against because of our postcode. If you could just hold there, I'll speak to you for, for a minute off the show, but I'll just yeah. introduce next week's show. But look, really appreciate uh, you taking the time to talk with us. Um, and I hope it's been a good experience for you. All right, Bill. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. If you enjoyed our show today, please like, share, and subscribe to our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Next week, I'll have <clears throat> Laura Wild on. Now, Laura is, is the CEO for Food Incubator Hub in Cairns, which is a new, is a new initiative to help entrepreneur uh, food manufacturers and also people from the uh, food producers to actually get things to market. So please join us again next week.